Remember that kinetic energy is energy of motion. Now we get to apply the concepts of work and energy to rotational motion. We know work is defined as the product of some force acting to move an object some distance. In the case of circular motion, the distance will be found in some arc length of a circle, which we defined as delta L a while back. We were also able to define the arc length in terms of the angular displacement and the radius of the rotation, which we can substitute into our work equation. This gives us the work equal to the force times the radius times the angular displacement. One more thing we might notice is that the force times the radius is equal to torque. So the torque acting on a rotating object over some angular acceleration gives us the amount of work being done on the force. So the torque acting on a rotating object over some angular acceleration gives us the amount of work being done by the force. Keep in mind that this is the net work and the net torque over the course of the system. You know what else? Power is the work divided by the time. So we can take that torque and angular displacement and divide it by our change in time. See what happens here? Hidden in that equation is the expression for angular velocity. So we can also write our equation for power as the torque times the angular velocity. Energy in rotational motion is also completely analogous to energy in linear motion. So if we examine the formula for kinetic energy, we know that it is equal to one half of the mass times the velocity squared. In rotational motion, mass corresponds to the moment of inertia, and we express velocity as angular velocity. So again, all we need here is to know how those variables are represented in rotational motion, and we can substitute them in for our linear motion. So again, all we need here is to know how these variables are represented in rotational motion. We can then substitute them in for our variables for the linear motion. Just like any other form of energy, we're going to have to label it with joules. Suppose we start a 0.320 meter radius disk turning by exerting a force of 200 newtons through one radian of rotation. How much work do we do? Well, we are given the radius force and the rotation, and we know that work is equal to the net torque times the angle of rotation. Remember that torque is the force applied to the radius, so we can solve for that with our given information. From there, we can multiply our torque by the number of radians, which is 1, and we have 64 joules of work done. From here, we can determine the angular velocity of the wheel. If this were a linear problem, we would be looking for the linear velocity. This is exactly what we're looking for here, except that it isn't rotational. So we can translate that linear kinematics equation into rotational equation. The final angular velocity squared is equal to the initial angular velocity squared plus the product of the angular distance times the angular acceleration. So where to start? Well, we started at rest, so the initial angular velocity is zero. So let's get rid of that term. At first, that doesn't really seem like that helps us a whole lot, but we do know that angular acceleration is equal to the net torque divided by the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia for a solid disk is found by taking the mass times the square of the radius and dividing that in half. So now we have this equation. We know our change in angle is one radian. We know mass, and we know radius. Torque we found in our last section, so all we really need to do is plug in our numbers. Don't forget that the angular velocity is squared, and we need to take the square root of that product. And we end up with an angular velocity of 5.42 radians per second. So what would be the rotational kinetic energy? One half of the mass times velocity squared gives us kinetic energy. Moment of inertia is analogous to mass, so we use the same formula for the moment of inertia that we did before. Hopefully we remember our order of operations here, and we come out with 64 joules of kinetic energy. This makes sense because we started at rest and now we have a certain amount of kinetic energy. And in the first part, we found that the work was equal to 64 joules. So our total kinetic energy should be 64 joules as well. When my daughter was little, one of her favorite things to do was take all of the canned goods out of the kitchen cabinet. It usually didn't take long before these cans ended up outside rolling down the ramp next to our porch. It did not take long for her to discover that some of the cans rolled faster than others. And thus began the races of the cans. I have no idea how long we sat outside trying to determine which soup would come out to be the champion, but some predictions were more difficult than others. Sometimes big cans would win, and sometimes the small cans. Some cans were the same size, but one would be faster than the other. Scientifically, if you look at what is happening, you are really getting into the conservation of energy. Each can starts at rest and the same height at the incline. Each can converts that potential energy into kinetic energy as it rolls down the slope. The difference has to do with what is inside the can and how it is affecting the can's motion. Now that we are rotating an object, there are two different types of kinetic energy. 
Rotational kinetic energy has to do with the actual rolling of the can, while translational kinetic energy has to do with the linear motion of the rotating body. The total kinetic energy of the can is the rotational kinetic energy plus the translational kinetic energy. So what's the difference? Rotational kinetic energy is the can rolling. The energy being provided to the can is going into rotating the can. The thicker the soup, the more energy is transferred into the rotational kinetic energy. Why? Because thick soup does not rotate well. It sticks to the sides of the can and you can actually think of it as a part of the can. Thinner soup does not rotate well. Take a glass of water with ice in it. For those of us with sensitive teeth, those ice cubes are a pain. I don't want them hitting my teeth, so I rotate the glass. What happens? The glass rotates, but the liquid and the ice stay in more or less the same position. The same thing happens inside the can. The liquid inside is not moving in a rotational manner. It is moving linearly, so less of its potential energy is becoming rotational. So rotational kinetic energy and translational kinetic energy are completely analogous. Both have to do with the motion of an object and are related to the mass and the speed of that object. The only difference is that the rotational kinetic energy has to do with the rotational motion of the object and translational kinetic energy has to do with the linear motion of the object. Think about a tire that is rolling along the ground. That tire is rotating, so it has rotational kinetic energy. It is also moving in a linear manner as it propels the car forward. Now if you lift the tire off the ground and spin it, it now only has rotational kinetic energy because it's not going anywhere. It is only rotating. Total kinetic energy of a rotating system is equal to the rotational kinetic energy plus the translational kinetic energy. Conservation of energy tells us that the cans have a certain potential energy at the top of the incline. This energy comes from the force of gravity pulling the mass and also depends on how high up we are. If we ignore friction, the only force acting on the cans is gravity. As the cans start to roll down the incline, the potential energy is converted into motion, or kinetic energy. At the bottom of the incline, the final kinetic energy is equal to the potential energy we had at the beginning. And then remember that final kinetic energy is both rotational and translational kinetic energies added together. So let's calculate the final speed of a solid cylinder that rolls down a 2 meter high incline. The cylinder starts from rest, has a mass of 0 0.750 kilograms and a radius of 4 centimeters. So here's what we know. Potential energy is equal to the total final kinetic energy. We also know how to find gravitational potential energy. And the total kinetic energy is rotational and linear kinetic energies added together. So these two expressions are equal to each other. Now before we go plugging in numbers everywhere, let's look at a few things. First, we need to know how to find the moment of inertia. Since this is a solid cylinder, it is found by taking 1 half times the radius squared. So we can plug that in for our moment of inertia in our equation. Now we also know that the angular velocity is equal to the velocity divided by the radius. So we can also put that into our expression. Now this is looking scarier as we go along, but let's do a few things with this before we again start plugging numbers in. First, we have the radius squared in a numerator denominator situation. So we can cancel those two things out. Then notice we have the mass in all three of our terms. So we can cancel this out as well. That half times a half there is a fourth, and we can denominate or out the two and the four, then combine the v squareds. And this is nice. Remember our goal was actually to find the velocity, so we can rearrange and square root. What we get is how to find the velocity of any solid cylinder rolling down an incline. Look closely at that formula. What is missing? What does not affect the velocity? For one thing, mass. Velocity of a rotating cylinder is independent of mass. High mass, low mass, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The velocity at the bottom of the incline will be the same, no matter what. The same is true for the radius. A big cylinder or a small one? Again, it will not affect the velocity of our cylinder. So what's left? The only thing that needs to be taken into account here is the height. So back to our problem. We are given height, radius, and mass of our cylinder, but we really only need the height. And so when we plug that in, we find a velocity at the bottom of our incline of 5.11 meters per second. Now keep in mind that this 4 thirds square root will be different if it's not a solid cylinder. You need to go back and look at whatever moment of inertia you have for the object that you have. So rotational kinetic energy is analogous to linear kinetic energy. And we're going to take 1 half times the moment of inertia times the angular velocity squared. The potential energy is equal to the total kinetic energy, just like it is in linear, and just like in linear motion, work is equal to the force times the distance, 
for the torque times the angular displacement. And power is equal to the torque times the angular acceleration.